Throughout the PS1 and PS2 eras, Capcom was at the top of its game with survival horror. The Resident Evil franchise really put it on the map with the original game actually coining the term, survival horror. But before they started remaking every Resident Evil game in existence, Capcom was pumping out other gems in the genre too. We had Resident Evil but with dinosaurs in the world of Dino Crisis, the zombie and psychopath filled sandbox of Dead Rising, and the panic inducing pursuits of Clock Tower 3. But one of their better horror games that never spawned a series and wasn't a critical or commercial mega hit, slipped through the cracks into obscurity that leaves it so hard to find that it's now worth hundreds of dollars on eBay. Haunting Ground is looked upon as a bit of an anomaly for Capcom. It's unlike any of their other games, and any other games in the genre for that matter. It featured elements of an adult nature and tones of sexuality and perversion that were absent from other mainstream titles like I mentioned before. Despite being overlooked on release, it developed a cult following over the years and has become highly sought after, and deservedly so. Have you ever felt genuine unease and been shook to your core? The sensation that horror media strives to achieve. Being a lifelong horror nerd, one thing I really truly miss is actually being afraid unnerved, disturbed, whatever you want to call it. That feeling I got when I watched Gremlins as a kid for the very first time, and I couldn't be alone in the dark for months after. Haunted Ground got under my skin and never left. It's a game that deserves to be talked about way more than it is. So that's what I'm here to do today. You're in for a wild ride. Demento, known as Haunting Ground outside of Japan, released on the PS2 in 2005, a big year for horror gaming fans. Very few games have had a worse release timing than Haunting Ground. To not make things too complicated, let's just focus on the North American region releases. Capcom kicked off the year with Resident Evil 4 coming out in the GameCube in January, followed by Devil May Cry 3 in the PS2 in March, and Haunting Ground in May, before they ported Resident Evil 4 to the PS2 in October to usher in a whole new console of players. Resident Evil 4 and Devil May Cry 3 were both huge titles and very successful, and would go on to be considered the best of their respective franchises. They both played very differently from their predecessors, so everybody was playing them to see all the new things. Haunting Ground being a survival horror game with fixed camera angles was a hard sell now when you could be in Spain suplexing enemies as Leon, or slaying demons in style as Dante. It was simply overshadowed by its bigger and better Capcom siblings. But before Resident Evil 4 were to go on to sell millions of copies and be one of the most critically acclaimed games of all time, it started out as an amalgamation of different ideas to try and spice up the series. During its development, there were at least four different versions of the game out there, and out of all of these different concepts, we're going to be focusing on one of them, simply known as the castle. This would see Leon invade Umbrella HQ and would find mummified remains of a superhuman housing the progenitor virus. Leon would then become infected and slowly mutate over the course of the game, and at some point would find a young woman trapped within a lab who is protected by a trained B.O.W. dog. The young woman in the castle segment would see its way into the final version of Resident Evil 4 in the form of Ashley and Castle Salazar, and there's even a dog Leon can save that will come back later to help him fight El Gigante. But more importantly, the concept of a girl and a dog would serve as the main focus point for Haunting Ground. It plays out like a longer version of the Ashley segment from Resident Evil 4, but instead of having Leon help you, you have a dog helping you instead. Both girls have to survive against people chasing them down who want to do bad things to them. Hunting Ground was seen as a spiritual successor to the Clock Tower series, as it would bear a lot of similarities, like the mansion, relentless pursuers, and having to run and hide to protect your character's sanity. You see, Clock Tower 3 was a big swing and a miss for Capcom falling well below their projected numbers, but they didn't want to accept defeat, so they wanted to give Clock Tower another chance, but the plan changed. The Clock Tower games generally follow the same formula, a young girl stuck in a location having to hide and escape from enemy pursuers without any weapons to defeat them. Being just a clone would potentially result in another flop, they needed something different this time, and that's when they came up with the idea of a dog companion to help you throughout the game to try and generate interest and boost sales, because Huey's presence in AI helped to make the game stand out at the time. 
The game follows an 18 year old girl named Fiona Belly who awakens locked up in a cage after being in a car crash. The cage is in a dripping wet basin of a gothic castle with chopped up body parts everywhere. She has no clothes except for a sheet and no memory of how she ended up here. With so many questions she makes her way out of the cage and up the stairs as she sets off to find some answers. Belly Castle appears to be located somewhere in Europe and seems to be in the middle of nowhere as it's only surrounded by forests and mountains. It is the home of the Belly family of alchemists who study immortality. It is almost entirely abandoned and only houses four residents who we will unfortunately come to encounter later on. On the outside it appears like a normal castle, however it has a dark side. The castle is a labyrinth with lots of rooms being booby trapped and filled with horrors like crypts, torture chambers and laboratories of freakish experiments. As Fiona makes out of the basement and arrives in the courtyard cold and afraid, the creepy atmosphere instantly hits you and the camera angle follows you as you walk giving the feeling like you're being watched. Upon reaching the bedroom Fiona is given some clothes from the castle maid Daniela who seems quite cold and distant. The clothes are exploitative and degrading with the skirt being really short and soon after our suspicions of being watched would be confirmed as a peeping Tom has poked out the eyes of a painting on the wall and has been spying on Fiona as she was changing. It sets the tone and you soon realise this game isn't going to be like any other ones you've played. Fiona is a shy and vulnerable protagonist who has now found herself trapped in this massive ominous castle as its residents come out one by one to stalk and capture her, each with their own motivations for pursuing her but it all boils down to the same thing, objectification. The gameplay of Haunting Ground consists of running and hiding and using your doggy friend as to not get captured by the stalkers chasing you. Huey is an integral part of Haunting Ground, he is a cute German Shepherd dog and he is the only means of attack for Fiona and the only hope of escaping the castle alive. The entire right analog stick is dedicated to commands for him so Fiona can command him to assist with puzzles and also attacking the stalkers. You can praise or scold Huey's actions and how you do so affects his reliability to Fiona. Each area has its own hiding spots that can be found which can help you evade your enemies. Huey is very good at distracting and buying you time to get to them. If you train him well enough he can actually begin to hide in these places with you. The stalkers are relentless and will chase you all throughout the castle so utilizing these hiding places is key. Fiona can do her little kicks and shoves but you want to use Huey as much as possible so you can break chase and get away from the stalkers. Dog companions and even being able to control and command them wasn't a big thing at the time and that really helped Haunting Ground stand out from the crowd. All of his movements are motion captured because Capcom wanted to study a real dog to convey true behaviour and movements and it really paid off. Huey was a great addition with very clever AI and it made for a really unique enjoyable companion. Survival horror games were known for their solo protagonists. Sure there's other characters that you interact with but you mainly face the horrors alone. And just like Huey can ease Fiona's nerves, he can do the same for the player too because having some company can really help ease the tension at times. When faced with certain scary events like seeing blood, hearing a scream or an enemy chase going on for too long, Fiona will enter panic mode which will make her trip on the floor, the screen will turn into a saturated monochrome and the controller vibrates to Fiona's heartbeat while an intense song plays. It's stressful stuff. During panic mode you can't stop her from running, you can only guide her direction as she sprints around blindly, shrieking. So you'll probably bonk her head quite a bit during this because she's so hard to control. If she bonks her head too much, she might fall down and one hit will kill her then. Thankfully there are items in the game that will help aid you in keeping Fiona's panic down while being chased, but it's clear she's not cut out for the Jill Valentine role. Stalker type enemies in most games, even today, tend to act very similarly to one another, just with varying degrees of speed, strength and attack type. The stalkers in Haunting Ground all feel substantially different from one another, keeping the exploration and evasion fresh and exciting as the game progresses. The developers were able to individualise their behaviours and make them feel like actual people with their own unique ways of pursuing you, and they each get their own quarter of the castle to chase you in. Each quarter is stunning to look at and well designed, even comparable to one of the most celebrated Resident Evil maps, the Spencer Mansion. The first stalker that you encounter is Debilitas, a hunchback homunculus that has the mental capacity of a child. A homunculus in the world of Haunting Ground is an artificial human created through alchemy. He was created by Ricardo Belli, another stalker that we'll get to a bit later on. 
Ricardo being young and inexperienced at the time ended up creating a malformed figure. He used a dog placenta as a base, which is why Debilitas will sniff and sometimes even get down on all fours. He can understand orders and respond, but his vocal cords never develop fully, so he can't speak normally, so Ricardo just orders him around to perform general tasks around the castle. Fiona first runs into him when he's playing with a dirty old doll, and upon seeing her, he tosses it away, preferring her over the worn out plaything. During the pursuit, he'll shout out, My dolly! <laughs> giggling and stomping with childlike delight, but also sometimes stopping to paw at the crotch of his pants in frustration. The implication here is that his adult body and his never fully developed brain may be in conflict. You get the feeling that Debilitas wants to do very bad things to Fiona when he catches her, even without understanding his own actions. This places the ongoing cat and mouse game between the threatening but blameless Debilitas and the helpless Fiona in an exceedingly uncomfortable one. The Bilitas isn't inherently evil, he's just fallen into bad company, and you almost feel kinda bad for him even though he's coming for Fiona's life. He is heavy, difficult to stun, he can jump, run, kick and punch. If Fiona gets caught and dies, each stalker makes some truly disturbing noises that are played over the death screen, suggesting something far more gruesome than murder has taken place, and it's left up to your interpretation. Each stalker also has their own chase music, and the one for Debilitas is a nightmarish tune. Despite Ricardo's warning, Debilitas continues to harass Fiona and Huey for quite a while, until all three of them meet in the chapel, where Fiona is forced to fight him. It's actually the only fight in the game that you can choose the outcome. You can let Debilitas live, or you can kill him. If you let him live, he bows to Fiona, accepts that he's been bested, and you can visit him later for a key to a bathroom stall that contains a really useful item in the form of metal boots that doubles Fiona's kick damage. The second stalker you encounter is Daniela, the maid of the estate, and is arguably the most fascinating character in the whole game narratively and visually. She is quiet but her movements are deliberate, her face emotionless and she speaks in a monotone voice. There is a scene that happens while the Bilitas is the main stalker and this shows Daniela isn't quite right. Fiona stumbles across a locked door and has a curious look through the keyhole. What she sees is a man going to turn on Daniela's cheeks. No, not those ones you dirty boys. He's slapping her relentlessly across the face, asking questions about an old man. She sits there, completely still and silent, just taking hit after hit, before turning towards the keyhole, beaten and bloody, to smile. She knows Fiona is there, watching. It's haunting. Round. After defeating the Bellatas, Fiona continues to search for a way out of the castle before Daniela appears out of nowhere behind her, with bloody hands telling her dinner is ready in another eerie scene. The next scene is an important one as we learn more about Daniela. While Fiona is eating the very questionable looking soup made for her, Daniela starts saying some very interesting things. My creator said he made me the perfect woman, but I cannot taste or experience pleasure or feel pain. Fiona decides to GTFO and once she leaves, Daniela licks the spoon that she was using, saying I'm not Fiona is exhausted from dealing with all these weirdos so she decides to get some shut eye and when she does, Daniela enters the room and heads over towards her. She begins running her hand off Fiona's unconscious body before pressing on her stomach, which wakes her up. Daniela then says, I am not complete. Before repeatedly bashing her head against some glass until it breaks, she picks up a shard and she turns to Fiona menacingly as she wants her now. Daniela's descent into madness is executed beautifully because of the slow build up. It really takes us time getting there. 
You could tell from the very first time you see Daniela, something was off. Now here she is trying to kill Fiona. But why? Well, Haunting Ground is all about Azoth. It's one of the most important symbols in alchemy. In the game, it is essentially the essence of life. A soul, a life force, and it's required to create artificial life. Each living thing has Azoth, however, Fiona's Azoth is special as it's directly descended from that of famed alchemist Aurelius Belli. And this is why these stalkers are pursuing her. They want her Azoth for one reason or another. Daniela wants it because she thinks it will finally make her a complete woman. It has never been confirmed if Daniela is a homunculus or not. There's things out there saying she is and she isn't, but we don't actually know. So it's open to interpretation, but I personally believe that she is a human and will continue down this path because it makes for a far more interesting story. I think she truly believes that she is a mechanical doll created by Lorenzo Belli, another stalker we'll get to. After being experimented on since childhood, the years of psychological and physical torture have left her infertile and very disturbed. Her senses are completely numbed down now, she doesn't feel anything, she only feels dead inside. Daniela's special hatred for Fiona seems to come from self-loathing and jealousy. She can't stand the image of her own body which is why she will scream when she sees her own reflection in the mirror. Being infertile, she has a strong complex towards women, the gender who give birth. She is jealous of Fiona because she won't lead the same life as her, as she can bear children. She wants to kill Fiona and steal her ass off to make her feel alive again, to be a complete woman, which presents the question of what makes a woman right down to the biological sense. Blood, flesh, woman, you vile creature. You lure the man into your filthy body again and again, and you are allowed to do it because you are a precious, precious little prince. Being completely crazy at this point, she sometimes acts like a simple maid, just cooking and cleaning things while she's supposed to be chasing you. Haunting Ground has seamless transitions between rooms. You can run from room to room, even into the outdoor areas, and not see a single load screen. As iconic as the Resident Evil door animations are, the lack of load screens is appreciated here so the tension when you're being chased doesn't get interrupted. There is only one enemy that will close doors behind them when searching for you, and that's Daniela. She will also announce her presence before entering any door in her way, because she is the maid of the estate. She doesn't run after Fiona, she only walks with the big shard of glass in her hand. Her chase theme embodies the character. The mixture of robotic sounds with feminine moans reflecting her feelings of being incomplete and her desire to experience human sensations. The song itself almost feeling incomplete like it was made up of fragments of a whole song. Disjointed yet tragic. The noises that she makes if she catches Fiona are arguably more scary than Debilitas. With her maniacal laughter, it's pure nightmare fuel. Prepare your ears. Her final encounter has she fight her in the skylight room in the mansion. It's a boss fight I enjoy, incorporating a puzzle into it as you push around blocks onto plates on the floor while avoiding getting hit. As you light up the mirror on the floor, she sees herself in the reflection in the skylight and she goes into a catatonic state and starts screaming. She screams so loud that she breaks the skylight and she is impaled by a shard of glass with a smile on her face because she is finally free from all of this. There is so much to admire about the character of Daniela. She is the best sort of villain, one with understandable motives that are visible in our own society, motives I relate to. I have had some pretty unhealthy pursuits of perfection in my life, and it completely undermines what it means to be a human. We are all flawed, and that's okay. Making mistakes is a part of life that helps us grow and become stronger. They are essential. Daniela is terrifying and unhinged, but I also sympathise with her a lot. Moira Quick did a superb job voicing her, which really helped amplify all those feelings. She is without a doubt one of the more memorable villains I've come across in horror games. She would be a hard act to follow, 
and the second half never matches the first half. But this inevitably brings us to the third stalker, Ricardo. Ricardo is easily the most evil antagonist in the game. He is the hooded figure you see around the mansion, always concealing his face, and the one who tells Fiona early in the game to remove that sheet from the couch in the study, which reveals a clear replica of her in a full state of pregnancy. What is going on here? Ricardo is nowhere near as cool and interesting as Daniela. We went from subtlety and uncomfortable illusions to clones and impregnation with Ricardo yelling right at Fiona. Let me into your womb! There's going to be a lot of clone stuff here and it's going to be confusing but you know just stay with me here okay? Ricardo was a quickly made clone of Lorenzo after Ugo betrayed his master and fled. However since there wasn't enough Azoth left to create a true clone, he was left incomplete. Aurelius is an alchemist who is the original version of Lorenzo and Ugo. Lorenzo is the last stalker in the game and he'll come up after this. Aurelius lived in the middle ages when alchemy prospered, soon discovering immortality. To him immortality meant an undying soul, eternal Azoth. He used clones to create bodies identical to his own, passing on to it the Azoth of his own body. So he continued to create these clones before they got old and died, theoretically being able to live forever. This became his life's purpose, his ultimate mission, and this continued until his 13th clone, Lorenzo. However, the next clone, Ugo, fell in love with a human which is not supposed to happen. In his eyes this now meant that his life's work, which he had ultimate conviction in, had been defeated by something so silly and worthless as love. Ugo decided to dip out of the castle and get away from these lunatics and emigrated to America and had a child who he named Fiona. Because of Ugo's actions, the uninterrupted cycle had been broken and Aurelius's Azoth had been passed down to Fiona without her knowledge. Due to Ugo being a clone of Aurelius and having a miracle child, when he's supposed to be infertile, that makes Fiona's Azoth a special kind because it directly descended from Aurelius. Are you still with me? This is just like Attack of the Clones, right guys? I don't know, I've never seen Star Wars. So anyway, seeing as Ricardo is incomplete, he ages quicker and appears old. His body has been degrading which has caused deep cracks in his face, so that when he finally does a face reveal, his face is not all as cracked up to be. To make up for his insufficient Azoth, he constantly extracts it from animals which is his plan for Huey, but thankfully Fiona saved him. His master Lorenzo sees Ricardo as a useless failure, a waste of space, but not because he's got a head like a cracked egg, it's because Ricardo doesn't understand human emotion. Ricardo believes that emotions are unnecessary in the quest to become a master alchemist, which goes against Lorenzo. As it turns out, Ricardo was actually the one behind the car crash of Fiona and her parents. He killed them off and took Fiona for himself. He wanted to recover the true Azoth from Ugo, but learned that he had been inherited by Fiona, and he thinks that if Fiona gives birth to him again, he can create an original Ricardo instead of another Aurelius clone. Fiona. I've decided you shall give birth to me. When I'm with you. He is a predatory scumbag and the game very much presents him as obsessed with gender roles, this hunter and prey dynamic. He believes himself a genius, very egotistical and abusive. We see him physically abuse two other stalkers in the game and getting pleasure to having power over them. He looks down on everybody else and plays with people's lives and says it's all for the greater benefit of alchemy, but in reality it's all for himself because he's proven to be a terrible alchemist. In the bad ending which almost nobody will ever achieve in the history of ever because you have to treat Huey badly, and how could you do that to such a sweet boy? Fiona doesn't escape but wakes up in a glass box where Ricardo taunts her, before it cuts to Ricardo's POV as he walks over to Fiona to stroke her head as she is now pregnant with his clone and she begins to smile and laugh because she is now insane too. It's all very messed up. It's made painfully clear very early that Ricardo is despicable. He's horrible in so many different ways and death was long coming for him. When it comes to his gameplay, he can run, punch and shoot his revolver. There comes a certain point where Fiona faints and wakes up in a locked cell in a water tower where Ricardo now reveals that he can turn invisible. I don't know about you guys, but I love going against invisible enemies, it's super fun. Ricardo's gameplay demonstrates a lot about his character. He acts tough, but he's weaker than every other antagonist in the game. He's just a dickhead with a gun. He turns invisible because the only way he can get an upper hand on an 18 year old defenseless girl 
is by pulling some slimy moves. There is a huge long spiral staircase that you need to work your way to the top of while pulling levers to connect the paths. Fiona runs out of stamina very fast and panic mode was in full force here for me. Huey was doing his best to help against the visible Ricardo but it was a frustrating time. When you finally reach the top of the tower it's time for Ricardo's boss fight where he gets taken out like a wuss and dies falling off a flimsy tower that he himself built to go splat in the pavement below. His segment is not particularly fun but his demise at the end is worth seeing it through. Now that Ricardo is out of the way it's time for the final area and stalker of the game, Lorenzo. The tone switch up for this segment gave me whiplash. Everything foreboding and unsettling about the game's narrative is transformed into this laughable full on camp. The enigmatic figure Lorenzo Belli, the mastermind behind this whole operation, is just some old dude who falls from his wheelchair, scrambling comically behind Fiona, flinging his arms all triple time. The only thing missing is some Benny Hill music here. Hang on, actually let me see what that looks like. His motives aren't any better as it turns out that he just wants Fiona's as all so he can create another clone to keep his immortality going. So much of what makes the castle grounds that you explore so terrifying is the idea of who's responsible for all of this. For most of the game you don't know who this is, but you can feel his vile desire for you, for Fiona, in the walls of every room you enter. This feeling is reinforced by the voyeuristic cutscenes and the static fixed camera angle. The fact that this vile desire is held by someone just so underwhelming is disappointing to say the least. Since he wanted Fiona's Azoth so badly, he instructed Daniela to unlock the door to her cage at the beginning of the game, he then watches her every move and even helps her sometimes to guide her to him. It's never been confirmed but it is clear that Lorenzo is the master that Daniela mentions. Since she is a maid, she does the cooking and cleaning tasks that Lorenzo is unable to do because he is confined to a wheelchair. Old man Lorenzo gets dispatched rather quickly by luring him into a steamroller and he is crushed. That can't be the end of it right? After Ricardo's Azos begins to take effect, Lorenzo's body rejuvenates and regenerates and he's turned into a younger version of himself. It granted him new powers, he can use electrical powers and teleport, throw punches and laugh so loud it scares Fiona. The final boss fight takes place in a small circular room where you try and deal as much damage as possible. Once enough damage has been done, Lorenzo falls into a pit of molten lava. Okay, now that's the end, right? Nope, still not done. After the boss fight, Lorenzo returns as a flaming skeleton which can one-hit Fiona if he touches her. The place is coming crumbling down so Fiona must kneel when a tremor is about to occur or risk falling over and Lorenzo catching her. Finally, he drops down and dies and now you can finally leave this mess. The game has a total of four endings and we already know about the bad ending so I'm happy to report the other three are a lot more pleasant. Ending A which is considered the best ending is achieved by treating Huey well like praising him when he follows your orders and choosing to spur the Bellatas and not kill him. Fiona frantically tries to get the key into the hole of the outer doors of the castle but she is struggling so hard but Huey calms her down and she opens it. The Bellatas comes out of the castle and they have an intense stir off before he bows to her and goes off about his business. Ending B is achieved by having Fiona treat Huey well, but this time kill the Bilitas. The cutscene is similar to the one of A, but this time when Fiona looks back, the Bilitas won't be there. And finally, to get Ending C, you must have at least completed the game once before. So on your second playthrough, defeat the Bilitas using the chandelier, so it doesn't kill him. Then go to his hut later on and visit him, and he will give you a key to the outer gates, allowing you to get this ending. The cutscene for this one is similar to B, only this time Lorenzo falls down the stairs, calling it to Fiona not to go. It is kind of disappointing how similar all the endings are. There's no real incentive to try and get them, especially when the one with the biggest difference it requires you to be mean and mistreat Huey. It's safe to say there's a lot of weird stuff going on in Haunting Ground. This ranges from its constant fixation on alchemy to the underground crypt filled with impassable fire that you can immediately extinguish by using a big golem who responds to commands that are stamped onto plates from a nearby plate machine. Haunting Ground plays out like its very own horror movie, similar to that of Clock Tower. The developers of Clock Tower pay huge respect to Italian horror filmmaker Dario Argento and his films, especially Phenomena. The director for Clock Tower, Hifumi Kono, loved horror films like this and wanted the game to feel like one. 
Many of the game's character graphics were digitised from photos of real people. The main character, Jennifer Simpson's name and design, was inspired by Jennifer Connelly's character in the movie. In an interview with Gaming.mo with Afumi Kono, he confirmed this. The direct inspiration is Phenomena, a film by Italian director Dario Argento. You know, back then there were a lot of game characters that conspicuously resembled characters from famous films. I must apologise Mr Argento because I did exactly that. Since Haunting Ground is a spiritual successor to the Clock Tower series, it borrows elements from the games and perhaps Argento once again. I can see elements of his film Suspiria and Haunting Ground, replacing the school for a mansion, still filled with strange inhabitants where you can feel something isn't right. Unlike Susie and Suspiria, there's a young believable protagonist wandering through this madness. Where Haunting Ground differs is in its in-your-face sexual nature that makes it a difficult game to talk about, but I'm gonna try. It's not very subtle and has caused many people to just write it off as being a gross horny mess that's only purpose is to excite players, but that couldn't be any further from the truth, and I want to tell you why. The game is drenched in sexualization of the female body, right from the very start of the game where Fiona is in nothing but a sheet and it's flowing around just enough as to not reveal too much. Once she finally gets some actual clothes it's not much better with this short little skirt that they frame in certain scenes just as to not show too much again. The jiggle physics are ridiculous and over the top, they bounce around almost every time Fiona stops walking or running. Whether this is a design flaw, a direct shot at trying to sexualize the character on purpose, or just fan service, who knows. But it does add a level of creepiness to the game's overall sexual themes. The fixed camera angle all too frequently takes on the eye level of someone possibly creeping around a corner or stirring a Fiona through the trees. More directly, there are instances when you are placed completely in the villain's POVs, simultaneously placing you as the objectifier and the objectified. She's exploited and dehumanised by these people, seen as just a piece of meat. It's a unique experience being a male player and it was terrifying to get a glimpse into what it was like to be a young woman being objectified. It truly disturbed me and made me play the game differently just to protect Fiona as best I could because I never felt fully safe. It made me think about my own life and how being a guy, it never crossed my mind about how I can walk around alone at night without any fear, just for being me. For a game to do something like this is so powerful. Some might think the constant over sexualization distracts from the game's ability to scare her, but I think it does the opposite. Portraying Fiona as an obvious sect object serves to heighten the sense of fear because we understand the game's antagonists are thinking of her this way. The cost of failure is very high for Fiona, as the stalkers seek to not only kill her, but to violate her in terrible ways as well. The game never outright shows you anything sexual on screen. It's mostly left up to the player's imagination, like those unsettling noises you hear in the death screens, only letting you hear what's going on to set your mind racing. It puts Fiona in an even more vulnerable position than she might otherwise be in, which makes her easier to be scared for. Haunting Ground uses sexuality as a fear enhancer, twisting the sexual desire. Instead of the stalkers expressing their attraction in a healthy way, it is frustrated and expresses itself dangerously and harmfully, a fear any woman could identify with perhaps, sadly. There is only one other woman in the game, Daniela, who Fiona should feel safe with. In any other game she would even be an ally or an unhappier story, even a romantic lead, but not here, because this is horror. For in the greatest horror stories we see themes of human sexual desire twisted or corrupted somehow. Silent Hill 2 definitely subverts sexual desire. James feels guilty over Mary's death, and yet it is so obvious that he wishes she was more like the sexually extroverted Maria. Silent Hill 3 also leans into sexual horror themes through birth and femininity, though much more subtle than Haunting Ground. This intersection of subjectivity, violence and desire is what elevates this game beyond other horror games even to this day. It managed to make you feel vulnerable and connected with a lot of very relatable fears like being followed or watched, or just generally feeling trapped and anxious in a situation you can't get out of. But those feelings are terrifying and much more unsettling than the usual supernatural threats like zombies and monsters. Fiction can be a way to safely explore uncomfortable ideas and come away from it stronger. In my opinion, horror should be dealing with gross subject matter. It should be disturbing and often problematic. Too many horror games give you too much of a sense of power where you can just mow down zombies on some thrill ride just relying on some basic gore and dismemberment. Don't get me wrong though, I enjoy those too, 
but tackling dark subject matter and exploring themes via exploitation gives the horror genre its bite. Of course it'll be subjective whether something crosses the line for you and I've seen many horror films approach these subjects unsuccessfully and thought they were terrible. Sex is when we feel at our most vulnerable. To turn our desire against us is to strike us down to our most primal core. But also, during sex is when we feel our most alive, so it works on a psychological level, to see what should be so natural made to be unnatural. Sex and horror overlap because they evoke some of the same phenomenal experiences and emotions, like pleasure and disgust. Sex horror is not an unholy union of opposites, in which horror is synonymous with harm and disgust, while sex equates to pleasure and lust. Rather, their edges blur and merge. They are entangled and sometimes belong together. Sex is not always a sight of shared intimate pleasure. It is at least sometimes awkward, uncomfortable, painful, even traumatic. If we suppress sex horror, it will stifle our understanding of how complex these representations are, but also how complex human sexuality is. Now the game is not without its flaws however, and some of them are pretty glaring. I mentioned previously the second half of the game doesn't match up to the first half, but it goes deeper than that. Haunting Ground takes the trope of damsel in distress and cries it to the max. Fiona is captured, she needs rescuing, she's rescued by a dog instead of a man. In every cutscene she does nothing to help herself. She falls over, she blindly follows certain characters into her doom, she gets saved by Huey, she screams, she faints, rinse and repeat. She's supposed to be powerless and be afraid for her life and I agree with that, to some degree. However, Fiona's behaviour in cutscenes is juxtaposed with her gameplay in a way that creates a little narrative dissonance for me, a term that refers to when the narrative and the mechanics are clashing with each other. Normally, I hate that phrase or the way it's used in video game reviews, but I do think it's quite fitting for Haunting Ground. Fiona learns about alchemy and is able to make potions and explosives. She also trains a dog to obey and protect her by attacking those who are pursuing her and seeking out supplies and necessary clues. She is by no means powerful, but she is resourceful. Unfortunately, none of her resourcefulness is shown in any of the cutscenes, like when she falls into a slowly moving conveyor belt. She just sits there accepting that she's about to get turned into mincemeat. Even in the final scene when she's unlocking the door, she's uncertain and shaky. There is very little growth over the course of the game. The ludo narrative dissonance occurs because as a player, I actually experienced a lot of growth throughout the game, and I assume Fiona did too. I even began to turn around and start attacking the stalkers on purpose, which can be very effective, so why did I not see any of this growth in Fiona during the cutscenes as well? I can understand the idea that this was done to continue to make the player feel vulnerable, but my issue is the way Fiona was depicted within the game's narrative that goes beyond her ability to fight back. It also has to do with her lack of agency in general. She continues to act like she doesn't know what's going on or what she's capable of doing. At one point she stops at a vanity and bemoans the fact that she can't freshen up and do her makeup. A lot of this just screams adult men writing a teenage girl. Playing through Haunting Ground I was scared like Fiona was and constantly on the edge of my seat, but I was also fascinated by what I saw and what I learned to do. I would have liked to see that aspect of the game expressed for Fiona as well. Haunting Ground has a number of costumes, you can choose between her different appearances seen throughout the game as well as some unlockable outfits depending on which ending you achieve. She can become a Texas cowgirl which gives her a pistol to shoot replacing her kick, which is the only way you can actually get a gun in this game. There's the appropriately named Illegal in Some States outfit in which she sports a black dominatrix getup, looking like she's about to peg you, that comes with a whip that replaces her kick. At least we get a joke costume in the form of a frog suit. This one has her set like a frog replacing her crouch. I'm not a fan of the cowgirl and the BDSM outfits, they bother me because they don't feel fitting for the rest of the game and feel contradictory to what the game is going for. They're pretty standard PS2 era Japanese fan service costume designs and it is neat that each of the costumes changes the gameplay a little bit, but I just feel like the costumes are so tone deaf with the game itself. You could argue that it's just unlockable costumes, you don't actually have to use them so who cares right? They just feel different in a game like this because Haunting Ground is exploring the horrors of sexualization and objectification. So why are we making costumes like this instead of more fun ones like the frog one? I love this game in spite of its shortcomings, but I don't see it getting remade or remastered today, at least not without a lot of changes. In fact Capcom only ever acknowledged the game once ever since it came out, by having a crossover with Street Fighter in 2018. I think video games are a lot more scrutinised nowadays, 
and the people who make video games would be a lot more hesitant about how this kind of game would be received. In terms of atmosphere and creativity, as well as a sense of surreal alienation, the game is great. It disturbed me in a way I've never felt before, and I think about it often still to this day. It's really a must play for anybody looking for obscure PS2 horror. Just don't pay a ridiculous price on eBay, so you might have to emulate it. For better or worse, Haunted Ground is a product of its time, which is both what makes it so good and so questionable at times, but a game I will always recommend. Thank you so much for watching this video, I really appreciate it, like you're a legend. This video took a long time to make, and I didn't even know if I wanted to make it for so long because of how this game is and all the themes in it, but I'm really glad I did in the end. If you enjoyed it, consider leaving a like, it would help me out. I do stream also on Twitch three days a week if you want to come over and hang out while I play some horror games or whatever else. The link is in the description. Otherwise, have a great day and I will see you next time. Peace.